42nd Psalm, Psalm 42. And I'm going to read two Psalms tonight, and that's not reading a great deal. It'll be 16 verses in the 42nd and 43rd Psalm. I just think it'd be almost impossible to read one without reading the other, because actually they go together and they deal with the same thing. And there's a text that we might take tonight that's found three times in these two Psalms, twice in Psalm 42, once in Psalm 43. And you might be looking for this text as we read these two wonderful Psalms out of the Word of God. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. Something so wonderfully, beautifully profound in these two psalms. And some things really difficult for my heart and soul uh, to discern and to understand. Uh, in verse 7, for instance, Deep calleth on the deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. While they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Judge me, O my God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation, O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and unto thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O oh God, my God. Why art thou cast down O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I want you to notice three verses tonight uh, in these two uh, wonderful psalms. These three verses, two of them are identical. The third is almost identical to the other two. And these three almost identical words are our text tonight. 
In verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now down in verse 11, you see the same thing. Only the ending is a little different. Yeah, I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Then over in the 43rd Psalm and verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. And I wrote some years ago and um, had published at the sword of the Lord a book called The Sweet Psalms for God's Saints. And in that book there is a chapter called The Psalm of the Sinking Saint. I don't know whether that's a good title or not, but the title was gotten from this text that we're speaking to you about tonight. It's the cry of a heart that's a thirst for God and a cry that looks within and says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? But in these two psalms, there are so many positive things said. And the psalmist seems to answer his own needs by his inspired words. He says to his soul, Hope thou in God. Yet here is a psalm, here are two psalms that they're a picture of a saint going through a time of great test and a great trial in the life of the writer of these two psalms. Now the writer of the psalms are the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah wrote perhaps a dozen of the 150 psalms. Their father died with some ignominy and shame under the ministry of Moses. His descendants write these psalms as if to somehow make up for the rebellion of their father who was judged and killed in the day of Moses. But these two psalms deal with some great and sorrowful and distracting and sad experience in the life of David, a believer. And there's no question, I think, what that experience was. You read of it in Second Samuel chapter 15. It was one of the most horrible things that a man of God, a Christian, a believer, one who knew the Lord, could ever possibly go through. David, you know, was the greatest king that ever sat upon the throne. And in spite of all of David's sins and his shortcomings, God said of David, This is a man after my own heart. And yet to a man whom, of whom God spoke, He's a man after my own heart. This great and tragic experience took place. He had a son, never was in submission. Uh, David's son, Absalom, was strong, athletic, and handsome. The Bible speaks of the hair of his head pulled once a year and the weight of it. He was really a striking man in his outward appearance, but inwardly, there was rottenness in his bones and in his soul. David killed us. Absalom killed his half-brother. He was the kind of man that wanted his way. If he didn't get it, he caused serious trouble. He's the man that set the field of the general of David's army, set his fields on fire, burned up all of his crops because he didn't respond immediately to the call of Absalom. And one day when David forgave him, brought him back into the family, so to speak, and brought him back into the palace, old Absalom, this usurper, would-be usurper, sat down at the gate of the, of the city of where David ruled, and sat at the gate and looked for all the people 
that had some kind of a complaint. He said to them, Why, if I were king, why well, I would take up your problem and solve it immediately. And he raised a question in the people's mind. Then one day, he took a chariot, 50 horsemen to ride in front of him, and declared he was taking from his own elderly father the kingdom of Israel upon which throne God had set David. There is not a more heartbreaking picture in all the Bible. It's heartbreaking when you see David during the Civil War. It's heartbreaking when you see David take his family that are yet with him and leave the palace. And he goes bent and broken and weeping. He goes down out of the east side of Jerusalem. He crosses the brook Ter um, Kidron. He goes up the sides of the hills of Bethany and Mount Olivet, weeping and broken as he goes. The war ends in the death of Absalom. David loved his son, but the war ended when Absalom is hung by that beautiful head of hair in a tree. And those who loved David and fought for his righteous cause put three arrows in his heart and buried him in a heap of stones. Then it's sad when you see David come back. He comes back to the palace and he comes weeping, broken, his soul deeply disquieted within him. He comes crying, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, would to God I died for thee. And I think you will not find in the whole Bible a more broken-hearted man. I think you will not find one with a greater burden than David had on this occasion. There are seven psalms. Seven of the 150 psalms are devoted to this incident. This great heartbreaking experience, this great and heavy burden, this time of great weeping that came to the man that God said is the man after mine own heart. You know, actually, there's nothing much that causes more dis uh, discontent and unhappiness than one that soweth discord. And the Bible speaks so plainly against discord. In the sixth chapter of Proverbs, God said, These seven things do I hate. Starts with a proud look, closes with a one who sows discord among the brethren. God said he hates it, and God proved that. When he took the life of Absalom, this young man that split the kingdom, divided the people, and divided the heart of David and broke the heart of David and brought this great sorrow in his life. I say there's seven of the 150 Psalms that were written with this great burden in mind that David had. The third Psalm, 42nd and 43rd, which I've read tonight. The 51st Psalm, the 55th Psalm, 69th Psalm, and 109th Psalm, seven Psalms are written about a great heartache and great burden in the life of a Christian. I once heard someone say, there are two things that surprise the new convert. Number one is the imperfection of Christians. And number two, that all is not roses for the child of God in this wilderness world. And that's true. I had a lady say to me one time, she said, I'm always the same. Things are always the same with me. Now really, first of all, I don't believe that. I think that the Bible plainly teaches that a Christian in this life, in this wilderness journey, see, you're saved and heaven bound, but you still live in a world governed by a fallen archangel by the name of Satan. And you're still in a battle. 
And I don't believe there's such a thing on the face of God's earth as a Christian without a burden sometime in their life and without a broken heart. I would dare say that in this audience tonight or any audience that a preacher might stand before, that there are people with such a heartache and such a burden and sometimes such a sorrow over lost and wayward loved ones that they would say, I'd give every material thing I own if I could see this burden lifted and this problem solved. You see, here's a good man, a man named David, a man after God's own heart, had this great experience in his life. Now I want us to look at it tonight. Great, great Christians, good Christians, are greatly opposed. Good Christians are greatly challenged, their faith is. Good Christians are many times greatly hated. And such was the case in Bible times and with David. Now I see in this great cry of David a deep, insatiable thirst for the presence of God. He said, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You see, David was going to appear when his heart was thirsting to be aware and sensitive to the presence of God. Now let me say to you tonight as a Christian, if you're born again, child of God, there's no way no way you can ever be out of the presence of God. But there are, are, are events and things that can happen to a Christian's life that will cause you to cry out, Oh Lord, where are you? And where is thy presence? And why aren't you here on the scene? Now David didn't actually say that to God. He said it inside to his soul. He said, O oh my soul, why art thou cast down within me? He had an insatiable presence for a consciousness of the presence of God in his life. Now, you know, this happens to a lot of people. It sometimes happens, thank God, to unsaved people. The Ethiopian eunuch had an insatiable desire to know the Lord, and the Spirit of God sent a man by the name of Philip, to lead him to Christ. Cornelius had an insatiable desire to know the Lord, and he, though he was unsaved, he prayed and he cried, and he, he um, worshipped, so to speak, and waited for the gospel to come. Sometimes this kind of a thirst, praise the Lord, comes to an unsaved person. But it also comes to Christians. Believers often experience this thirst. Times of great sorrow. Some of our folks are going, going through it. Part of life. In times of great crises. In the times of great need of power. God's people cry out, O oh, my soul, where art thou cast down within me? O oh, God, where are you in this insatiable thirst for God? And I want to tell you folks, if you are in this experience tonight. You're in a place where God put you, and you're in a place where God is working in your life, and you're going through an experience where God can be sweeter to you than He's ever been in all of your life. Don't ever discount and don't ever question the goodness and love and judgment of God when your soul is thirsty and your heart cries out for a manifestation of the presence of God in your life. I see in this something else. I see a deep expression of lonely despair. You know, the psalmist said, My tears have been my meat day and night. Why, who in this audience tonight had not had that experience? My tears have been my meat day and night. Such a sorrow, such a burden, such a loneliness. Food meant nothing. Meat was undesirable. My tears have been my meat day and night. 
Why art thou disquieted within me? In the 42nd Psalm, verse 9, Why hast thou forgotten me? You know, the soul may feel that way, but God never forgets you. And God never forgets where you are. I often think when I was speaking one Saturday night some years ago down in Ohio at the Tree City Baptist Church uh, is where this took place. And I was in my little motel room and Saturday afternoon and waiting on the Lord and praying, praying, and um, asking the Lord to give me the message that he, he wanted me to bring for Saturday night. And um, the Lord laid on my heart four words. He careth from you, for you. In First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, He careth for you. And I, I questioned, now is this really the Lord? And I said to the Lord, Saturday night service, there, the preacher had said there'd be unsaved people there and it's to be an evangelistic service and this wonderful statement to Christians he careth for you he careth for you and I couldn't get away from it my soul was burdened with it and I couldn't depart from it so I went to the church that night and I believe under the direction of God preached on four words he careth for you when the invitation was given, God blessed His wonderful Word. There were some folks who came to be saved. There were some Christians whose hearts were heavy and they came and they just found the peace of God once again in their life. But I remember one lady. I remember for two or three reasons. First of all, she was dressed all in black. She was neatly groomed, about 50 years of age and dressed all in black. And she came down the aisle carrying a Bible and weeping. And she came down and knelt at the altar. And um, it just so happened everyone was busy. I spoke to this lady and I said, And why did you come? She's carrying a Bible. She said to me, Preacher, This has been the most heartbreaking week of all my life. And she said, when I left my home tonight, my Bible was laying on the piano, on the piano bench. And she said, as I walked out of my home and picked up my Bible and started for the house of God, she said, I stopped for a moment and I cried out, Oh God, don't you know where I am? And don't you know how much I need you tonight? And she said, I was weeping. And I came to church weeping. And she said, thank God tonight. I've been reminded from the Bible, God never forgets where you are. And God knows how much I need Him. And I'm so happy tonight, my dear Christian friend, that I can tell you, God never forgets where you are. You could not be in such lonely despair as to ever be forgotten of God. You know, old Elijah made that mistake. Elijah, I, it's very interesting about Elijah. If a man ever lived in the Word of God, Elijah did. Uh, if you study the life of Elijah in the uh, uh, first and second Kings, you'll find this expression, and the Word of the Lord came unto him. And the Word of the Lord came unto him. And the Word of the Lord came unto him. Over and over and over again. And every time Elijah made any kind of a move, it was because, and the word of the Lord came unto him, except one time. And there's no perfect man, not even in the Bible. One time a woman sent him a message. You kill my prophets of Baal, I will have your head by tomorrow night. And you do not read, and the word of the Lord came unto him. But you read that Elijah ran and got under a juniper tree and said, I'm the only one in all the world standing for God. And I'm the only one left standing for the Lord. And under a juniper tree did something that a Christian ought never to do. He said, I'll just soon die and get it over with. And he came apart at the seams. He had a nervous breakdown, I guess. And he said, I'd just rather die and get it over with 
I'm so troubled. But God sent an angel. And when Elijah awoke under the juniper tree, there was a cruise of water. And there was bread on the fire. And God wanted to remind Elijah, even though you're out of my will, and you've run, and you've gotten out of this juniper tree, and you've soured on the whole world, and you think the whole end has come. I want you to know, I know where you are. And I've sent one of my holy angels to prepare you a meal. And the Bible says that Elijah went in the strength of that food forty days and night. And so, dear friend, you cannot be in such lonely despair so that God doesn't know where you are. And God knows where you are. And God cares tonight. And I like what that lady said that came to the altar that night. She said, Now, I know for sure God knows where I am. And God knows how much I need Him. And I believe God wants every Christian to know that. I see something else in this. I see a deep embarrassment in it. You know, when people saw David so cast down, his own son trying to take the kingdom from him, his son who was a murderer and who sought to take the kingdom from him, you know what people said? They said to him, Where is thy God? Oh, you've, you've written all these psalms yourself. David might have written a hundred of them. You've been called a man after God's own heart. And look what's happening to you. You a Christian, you a believer, you a man of God. Look at what's happening to you. Where is thy God? Now I'll, I'll remind you something tonight. If that ever happens to you, and it's probably already happened. If that ever happens to you, I want you to remember one thing. That 2,000 years ago there was hanging on the cross on the hill of Golgotha, the perfect Son of God dying for the sins of the world, robed in his own blood and crowned with a crown of thorns. And somebody said, as Jesus was dying for your soul and mine, where is thy God? If you be the Son of God, why don't ye come and help you now? And not only that, even the Lord Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the pressure of the world of darkness and the burden of sin upon the Lord even made him cry out. These maybe are messianic psalms because they foretell of the cry and the heart suffering even of the Lord Jesus. And people said to David, where is, where is thy God? And they said to Jesus, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, for he said, I am the Son of God. You know, Bob Ingersoll, I never, never heard him. I think maybe he's still alive when I was a boy. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think he was. I never heard Bob Ingersoll. He was, a, he was the, the um, counterpart, so to speak, to um, Madeline Murray O'Hare. God knows how hot hell's going to be for that woman. But God saved one of her boys, praise the Lord. And one of her sons is a Christian. The other, she's retired now. She's going to write more books against God. And she's retired. And one son's taken over uh, her work of atheism. And, uh, you know, the Bible says a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I'm careful about calling people a fool. I don't have that authority, but God does. And God said a person says there is no God's a fool. And I don't care. I've heard scientists and PhDs and, and highly educated people. You know, you can get educated clear beyond your intelligence. You can get so educated you don't have a bit of sense in the world. And I've heard people try to explain uh, how they know there is no God. And talk about 50 million years ago and all that Tommy rot. It's nothing to it. The dumbest thing I ever heard is a person who says there is no God. And the Bible says the fool, the fool has said in his heart. It's not an intellectual conclusion. It's from a wicked birdie.
dirty, rotten heart that needs to be washed in the blood of Jesus. Anyway, Bob Ingersoll took out his watch, pocket watch, and he said, there's no God. He said it to audiences all over America. He said, there is no God if there be a God. Let him kill me in 60 seconds. And he'd uh, go on talking, and when he had about 10 seconds left, he'd say, 10 seconds left, 8 seconds left. Why, don't, why doesn't God kill me? And God didn't kill him. And a lot of foolish people said, maybe he knows what he's talking about. No, all he proved, there is a God of infinite mercy who waits and waits for men to be saved. And that's all that he proved. But um, people say, where is, where is your God now? And Bob Ingersoll said, let him kill me. Well, one day Bob Ingersoll died, and he's in hell tonight. And I believe if, if you could talk to Bob Ingersoll tonight, who said, now, where is your God? He'd say to Christians when they were sick, where is your God? He'd say to Christians when someone of their loved ones had passed away, where is your God? He'd say to Christian people uh, when sorrow and tears fall down their face, where is your God? This is not supposed to happen to a Christian. No, you don't get that out of the Bible. Let me tell you, the greatest Christian ever lived said uh, three times I was beaten with rods. You know what the definition uh, uh, in the Bible is? Beaten with rods. It was called the, the vine stick. Take an old gnarled, twisted grape vine as large as your arm. And 39 times it killed most people. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian ever lived, said three times I was beaten with rods. Five times I received 40 stripes, save one. 39 stripes with the cat of nine tails. That plaited leather with metal in it, beaten and torn. You know... I have read where people thought the Apostle Paul was older than he was. He was about 67 when he died because, oh, I had suffered. He said, um, a night and a day in the deep, holding on as to some piece of wood floating in the Mediterranean, uh, night and a day in the deep, in jail often. Listen, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that there's not going to be some valleys in your life. But thank God there's somebody to go through it with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Let them mock. Let them mock. Let them say, where is thy God? And one day, like the man in hell, they're going to cry, Oh, give me a drop of water. And oh, send somebody to my five brothers who are lost. They're going to know someday. Sin doesn't pay, but living for God does pay. But it's going to be too late when a lot of folks know. Oh, this, this, this is a time of deep embarrassment because of the unsaved saying, Where is thy God? Then you know, when something like this happens to a Christian, there's always a deep sense and memory of better days. And that's what David's talking about. He said, I remember these things. I remember I've, I've always gone with the multitude to the house of God. I, I've gone with a voice of joy and praise and with a multitude that kept a holy day. He remembered better days. I remember calling uh, one, uh, one time many, many years ago, I guess it's been 40 years, and out on the north side of the city, uh, there was a two, looked like two, a two-story house, looked like an apartment downstairs and one upstairs. And uh, the people I wanted to see were, were upstairs. Very, very unkept looking place, a whole setup. But I climbed a set of stairs outside the house, knocked on the door. And a tall, a poorly dressed man came to the door. I asked him, you Miss So-and-so? Yes, I am. And I, I said, I want to talk to you. Open the door and let me in. I went in. Uh, untidy, filthy place. You could just see sin and squalor everywhere. And I began to talk to him. I said, are you a Christian? 
He said, I don't know. I said, well, you, you've never been saved? He said, I'm not, I'm not sure, but what I might have been. He said, I was a deacon in Alabama for many years. And he said, I began to slip here and here. And he said, you see the end of it all. And there was this man's saddest countenance I've ever seen. And there was his family poorly clad. And I thought, oh, how, what poor reward for the backslidden Christian that can say, I remember better days when I had the joy of the Lord in my heart. Do you remember some things? Do you remember when you read the Word of God with delight? You didn't turn the page to see how long the chapter's going to be. You read it and your heart delighted in the Word of God. Do you remember whenever human contact was a chance for you to be a witness for the Lord? Do you remember? Do you remember when the house of the Lord was the dearest place on earth? By the way, I thank God I can say that tonight. It's still the dearest place in the world for me. I love my home. I love 1045 Dover Road. I love being home so much that, that I'll tell you the greatest burden in the world, get in a car and head for the airport to go a few hundred or thousand miles away. I love my home. But I'd be so happy if the Lord tarries. If he, I, I, I won't be happy if he tarries. But if he tarries, I'd be so happy if I could go home to be with the Lord right here. I tell you, there's nothing in this world so great as the house of the Lord. I'm not talking about a church building. I'm talking about a place where Christ is on the lips of every believer. And the Word of God is preached in all of its purity. And the songs of Zion are sung from the hearts of saved people. They're nothing like the house of God. Do you remember when the house of the Lord was the dearest place on earth? Do you remember when the people of God were your only crowd? Do you remember? Do you remember when you served the Lord faithfully and felt it a privilege? Do you remember when you didn't say, Oh my goodness, it's Sunday. I got to get up and get on that bus and drive a bus. Do you remember uh, when you served the Lord faithfully and felt it a privilege? You remember when you said, My, praise the Lord, Sunday's finally come. And I'm going to get to go out on my bus and bring these little boys and girls and maybe some of their moms and dads to hear the Word of God and pray that they'll be saved. Do you, do, do you remember when you used to say, Oh, my, it's Sunday. Finally, Sunday's come, and I have to be there an hour early because I sing in the choir. But thank God I have the privilege of singing the praises of the Lord. You remember when you taught, you, you teachers taught a Sunday school class and the Lord's Day come uh, would come, you'd say, oh, I'm going to see little Johnny and Betty and Susie and Mark and Jim and Jean. I'm going to see them today. And I just love those little old children. But a lot of Sunday school teachers say, Oh my, Sunday morning, I'm going to have to face that mob of little little heathens again. Oh, listen, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Do you remember when you served the Lord faithfully and felt it was a privilege? I mean, just happy for the privilege of doing something for Jesus. You see, when one gets down and broken, and crushed until he cries, Oh, my soul, why art thou disquieted within me? He starts to reflect and remembers better days, and that makes this day even worse. Do you remember when your prayer life was a rich and rewarding experience? Do you remember when your conscience, when you and your conscience were in perfect agreement? Do you remember when you and Jesus walked together in unbroken fellowship and you talked with Him with every breath you breathed and it was so sweet to walk with the Lord? 
Are you tonight in an experience when the remembrance, the recalling of better days makes your moment tonight even worse? This wonderful text, this is a wonderful text, says to me there's a deep sense of faith and hope in the heart of the child of God. Old David said, My soul, why art thou disquieted within me? But then he said, Hope thou in God. He said, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He said, One of these days the Lord's going to smile on me. And you know, that's, that's what your countenance is all about. It's when you look at the radiant, shining face, the Son of God. He gives something divine into your own countenance. And David said, yet I, yet I shall praise him for the help of his countenance. And David said something else, and I like this. He said, in the night his song shall be with me. And you know, the people in the Bible had that experience. Uh, Paul and Silas had it at the midnight hour, and in jail they began to sing, sing and to praise God. And their song was heard, and the uh, people were saved. You see... Uh, there's, there's an answer to this thing. There's an answer to this burden. I said in the prayer meeting tonight, I don't mind carrying the Lord's burdens, but I, I want to have enough wisdom if God will help this poor, ignorant Christian. I want to have enough wisdom to know when it's the devil's burden. I want to carry any of his. I want to carry the Lord's until he wants me to lay it down, but I want to carry in the devil's. You've got to be sure that this thing tonight that's bothering you is not of the devil. If it's God's burden, remember, there's a song in the night. I was preaching to Dr. Jack Hiles one time, and I heard him say that he went back to his room one night, and like preachers, a lot of times away from home, and he, he, he was a little bit discouraged and sad. He said he got to thinking about how good it was to be saved. And said he just got to count his blessings, got happier all the time. And Dr. Hiles is a very sensible man, but he jumped up on he got jumped up on the bed with his feet and started jumping up and down and praising the Lord. And he got happy and he was making noise. Yeah, just uh, praising the Lord. And somebody knocked on his door. And there's a man from the next room. And the man said, what's all the fuss in here? And Dr. Hyle said, I'm praising the Lord. He said, well, couldn't you just save it till in the morning so I can get a little bit of sleep? Have you ever been that happy? Listen, God wants you to have the peace of God and to be a happy Christian. And the psalmist said, in the night his song shall be with me. Here's the answer to it. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Don't carry it. Put it on the Lord. That's a, God's invited you. Put your burden on the Lord. I often have given an illustration years gone by in this church of a man. And I, I know this has happened. This is not just some dreamed up something. I've seen a many a time in my life a man down in the south line Southland, walking with a bag of grain, corn, most of the time on his shoulder, walking with one hand on his hip, walking to the town to go to the grist mill to get that corn ground into meal. Said one day, a farmer came with a big spirited steed, a beautiful horse's team, and, and uh, a great big nearly new wagon, the big spring seat on it. And he pulled on the lines and said, Whoa! And he said to the man, Neighbor, get up in the wagon and ride with me. And the way you get in a wagon is you climb up over a wheel. So this man uh, held on the wheel, bag of corn on his shoulder, climbed up over the wheel. And the man driving the wagon, the big spirited team of horses, said, uh, Sit down on the spring seat here with me. I'm going to town. Man sat down, still holding one, uh, one shoulder uh, with a big old heavy, about a hundred pound sack of grain on it. And the man driving the wagon said, Neighbor, put your, 
put your burden down in the bed of the wagon. Those two horses out there could haul a hundred times what you carried. And neighbor, put your burden on the Lord. He's a big God. Hallelujah. His shoulders are so strong, He holdeth the world upon them. And He's big enough for all of your burdens. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. David said, The day's going to come when I'll go to the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp, I'll praise thee, O God, my God. David said, One of these days I'm going to be playing my guitar again. Only didn't say guitar, it said harp. I have a little bit of trouble relating to this because I couldn't make music on any kind of strings in the world. But he meant one day I'm going to be singing. And so will you if you really know and love the Lord. You know, I think something a little girl said about her daddy describes what a happy Christian is even though that Christian may be carrying a burden. She had a Christian father. He'd pray and read his Bible, love the Lord and love this family, and showed it. And one day his little girl said, I believe my daddy goes to heaven every night because he's so happy every day. That's the way it ought to be. Listen, friend, you can't beat being saved. I don't care if you're bald-headed and teeth all gone, bunions on your feet and you're 50 pounds overweight. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. And that you can't beat it. It's a, like Glenn Ewell, who saved in this church, said, it's the greatest deal I've ever had. And he was a millionaire. Listen, you can't beat being saved. And I, I don't believe that a Christian should sit down and... Walla in his misery. 